Today we're going to have a look at the subsidy diagram and we're going to use the supply and demand approach. You can use the marginal approach as well, but certainly on the specification we use, you don't need to. So here we've got supply curve, demand curve, and equilibrium at A, price P1, Q1. Now let's introduce the subsidy. So what we have then is a movement to the right of the supply curve. This is because the uh, firm gets a subsidy. This can potentially reduce their cost of production and it gives them an incentive to increase output. So we've now got a new equilibrium now at point B. So as you can see, this has led to an increase in quantity demanded and also a fall in price. What we can show now though also is the impact of the subsidy in terms of who actually gets the subsidy. So let's have a look. The subsidy then is just the vertical distance between the two supply curves. So this area here, let's call it BC. So BC is the size of the subsidy. But who actually gets this subsidy? If we have a look and bring that across there, there and across there. As we can see here, this shows us who gets the subsidy. Now basically, with a subsidy, the producer will get this amount and the consumer will get this amount here. So the consumer will get area P2, P1, let's call it DB, and the producer will get P1, P star, CD. So as you can see here, because the demand curve is relatively inelastic, most of the subsidy is passed on to the consumer. And we can see that here. This area is bigger than this area. Or, this point to this point, the consumer part of the subsidy, is bigger than this point, which is what the producer gets. But interestingly, we can see something else here. Look at quantity, okay? Look at the increase in quantity demanded. It's actually relatively small. I OQ1 was the initial, sorry, I'll relabel that as P2. OQ1 was the initial amount uh, demanded, and now it's gone to OQ2. It's a very small increase. So, what can we say? If the demand curve is relatively inelastic, most of the subsidy will go to the consumer, but it won't be very effective because there isn't much of an increase in consumption. We can contrast then that diagram with this diagram. This is a diagram showing an, uh, an elastic demand curve. Now what can we see here? I've filled it all in previously, but basically two things. One, in this case, the producer gets the vast amount of the subsidy, and the consumer very little, but notice the increase in quantity demanded. It goes from OQ1 to OQ2, so we've got a big change. So what can we say? If it's elastic demand curve, most of the subsidy will go to the producer, but more importantly, with an elastic demand curve, the big increase in quantity demanded. And that means um, that subsidies tend to be more effective with elastic goods. If we go to this middle board then, we've got some key points that we can go through. The subsidy lowers the firm's cost of production. The subsidy shifts the supply curve to the right, therefore we've got an increase in quantity supplied. There's an incentive for producers to supply more. Remember, it's only an incentive, potentially, the producer might just use it as for higher profits. There's an extension of demand, that just means there's a movement down the demand curve. There's a reduction in market price. There's an increase in quantity demanded. The size of the subsidy ideally should be equal to EB or the external benefits. The size of the subsidy should be equal to the external benefit. If we have too big a subsidy, then of course we'll have overproduction. If we have too small a subsidy, we won't have, um, have solved the situation. The subsidy is usually given for merit goods associated with positive externalities. And don't forget, elasticity 
and the incidence um, of the uh, subsidy are both important things to consider and they depend on the elasticity of demand.